Namaskar. And it is so great to be with all of you here today. And let me thank uh, Director Banerjee. Thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Professor and Dean Gomes, for uh, introducing me and welcoming me here. This institution embodies everything, the hopes of a generation and also the progress of a nation. And I want to express my thanks as well to Asia Society Policy Institute and the esteemed uh, Dr. C. Raja Mohan for co organizing this event. I've had a long time connection with the Asia Society and it's wonderful to bring that together here. If I seem a little tired, it's because I arrived on a plane last night, but I'm still wide awake with the joy of what happened in this past week because I had the honor of participating in the first official state visit of Prime Minister Modi to the United States. And I was privileged to witness something that was truly remarkable. So let me tell you first what it is that I saw. I saw first an incredible celebration of the bond between the, two, the world's two great democracies. And as President Biden so clearly heralded, I saw a celebration that is, quote, the defining partnership of this century. Words I'm sure no American president has ever said about the relationship with India. And I also saw vice versa, the unequivocal recognition as Prime Minister Modi so eloquently said that the scope of our cooperation is endless and the chemistry of our relations is effortless. I witnessed firsthand the rapport between our two leaders, between President Biden and Prime Minister Modi. I saw the power of transformative friendship. And in sum, I saw history being made and history being reframed. This is the moment that we are living through. Now, there can be high expectations sometimes when it comes to US and Indian leaders, when they come face to face. And we all know that visits can be full of good intentions and generate plenty of warm feelings, but not always yield concrete results that actually help our people out and advance our relationship. But for this visit, the answer to that question, would it produce something, was a resounding yes. Not only was there a natural friendship and real partnership, but I was also struck by the depth and the breadth of the truly important initiatives that were announced demonstrating again how India and the United States are collaborating on nearly every human endeavor. You see, the projects that we are initiating will indeed change our countries, change our people, and change our world. Now, the celebration that I saw was real. From the White House to the Capitol, the American government, across party lines, congressional houses, and the different branches of government all brought together a fantastic celebration. From the welcome on the White House lawn with pomp and American tradition, to the India-inspired menus that incorporated millet touches. From the thoughtful gifts to PM Modi's stirring words in Congress, his second address. From the groundswell of pride among Indian Americans who saw that their place in the US-India story was so appreciated to the graciousness of the Prime Minister and the Indian delegation. It was all so very memorable. One of my favorite images our director pointed out already. It was Anchal Sharma, one of IIT Delhi's own students and currently a Fulbright scholar at MIT. She shared a stage with her Prime Minister and our First Lady, Jill Biden. Anchal is drawing on her superb Indian and US educational opportunities to advance her work in assistive technology, which in turn will benefit so many people here and throughout the world. I found Anchal an inspiration, a testament to what's possible when the US and India come together, a future of boundless possibility. In Prime Minister Modi's words, a future where the potential of our synergies is limitless. After such an amazing and auspicious, hope-filled week, now as I return to India to continue that work, to lead that work here in Delhi together, I'm propelled by a fundamental realization. And it's the recognition that translating our incredible potential together into an incredible reality 
comes down to us, everybody in this room and beyond, how much confidence our countries have in each other and that our people have in a shared vision. Which is why I'd like to understand, underscore my remarks today with a simple Hindi phrase, Satni Sakar Karna. Satne Sakar Karna. Making dreams into reality. Thank you for your generous applause. Just a little bit of Hindi. But I'm a huge fan of this idea. Because as many of you know, I come to Delhi from California. California, a place in America that distills the place where people dream big and a place where big dreams come to life from that Hollywood director who transformed a story of cross-cultural discovery set across the stars into Avatar, still the highest grossing film of all time, to Astrolab, a California startup company that reimagined all-terrain travel to help astronauts move across the surface of the moon, to my own hometown of Los Angeles, which will soon realize its dream of uniting the world through sport when the city hosts for a third time the Olympic Games and for the first time, the Paralympic Games in 2028. Globally, just like Los Angeles, the United States has shown time and again, we are, when we are at our best, that through imagination, through great spirit and hard work, dreams can come true. But I don't think I need to convince any of my Indian friends about this, because India is increasingly a place where dreams become reality every single day. After all, in India, a young boy selling tea grew up to lead his country on the global stage. In India, a Santali teacher rose up to become president of her country. Interestingly enough, in the United States, it's the son of a blue collar, unemployed worker and the daughter of two immigrants who lead our country as well. You see, these dreams that are so amplified here today show that in India, improving lives and pulling people out of poverty is possible through its transformative technology, through the progress that we are witnessing each and every day. Our countries have so much in common because the Indian dream and the American dream are two sides of the same coin. We share the same vision. Our people want to achieve success for our communities, success for our families. We embrace possibility, new opportunities, new knowledge, and a chance to make a difference. We want to leave the world better off than we found it and more secure than we know it to be, not just for ourselves, not just for our countries, but for this entire planet. The other thing we share is that our connections are very personal. People keep asking me what's changed since I first came here as a teenager. So much has, but what hasn't changed is the warmth of this country, the affinity and friendship that for me as a Californian and an American feels so much at home. And we're linked by a diaspora community that is more than four million strong in the United States through educational and business connections and appreciation for each other's cultures and our friendship. It's growing stronger with our shared experience and our shared ambitions. And we see the results of this friendship every aspect of our relationship. Let me share just a few statistics that underscore this. Last year, one, out of every five US student visas issued worldwide went to an Indian student. And over 200,000 Indians are now studying in the United States. The United States last year became India's largest trading partner with more than $191 billion in two-way trade. India conducts more military exercises. Right up there, you can see it, with the United States than it does with any other country. More than 450 Indian nationals work at the United States National Institutes of Health Intramural Laboratories, which is the highest number of biomedical scientists from any Asian country currently at our NIH. And in the United States, more than 20 elected and appointed government officials proudly claim Indian heritage, not least of whom is, of course, the second most powerful person in the United States and the daughter of India, Kamala Harris. Indian origin CEOs had many of the United States' largest and most iconic companies. One friend joked, it used to be an impediment to becoming a CEO if you were Indian American. Now it seems to be a requirement. In fact, Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, Starbucks, Adobe, some of our most iconic companies, more than 10% 
A Fortune 500 company CEOs are of Indian ancestry, even though Indian Americans are just 1% of the population. And within the past six months, five members of the US cabinet, President Biden's closest government advisors, have come right here to meet with their counterparts in India, and more visits are planned. So in sum, the Prime Minister's visit crystallized that our partnership is accelerating at a breathtaking speed and having an undeniable impact. But that raises an interesting challenge. You see, in so many areas, we're cooperating more closely than we ever imagined that we could. So what do we do when our partnership's achievement outstrips our earlier expectations? Of course, this is a great challenge to have. And luckily, I believe there is a simple answer. It is time, my friends, for us to reframe our vision, to reset the moment, and to dream an even more ambitious reality, and then make it real. Because I come from Hollywood, the land of the sequel, where the story is everything, and we're always asking in every movie, what happens next? So today, distinguished guests, colleagues, that's my question to you. When it comes to the United States and India, what happens next? How do we frame this new vision, one that recognizes past achievements and builds on our long-standing shared values to create a better future? How do we prioritize new starts and invest in new opportunities? And how will we accommodate difference even as our friendship becomes closer? For us to prosper further, how do we transform old patterns and systems in our government and between our businesses? How do we break down cynicism even and find new awareness, swap out old worn stereotypes for more enlightened understanding, nuance, and accelerated action? After all, the world isn't the same place that it was. If these past three years have taught us anything through the trauma that we have lived through, it's that our world can change overnight. And while we've made it through to the other side of the pandemic, we are painfully aware of our mutual vulnerability globally. Today, global supply chains feel more brittle. Our national and security borders can't be taken for granted. Our planet cries out for relief, and even our fundamental values of democracy, freedom, rule of law feel globally under attack. So how can the United States and India together translate our dreams into a more peaceful, secure, and prosperous future for all peoples? Well, today I have a few ideas, and they're all based on one fundamental fact, that the United States and India are better off and we produce better results when we work together. When we work together for peace, when we work together for prosperity, when we work together for our planet, and ultimately for people the people of India, the people of the United States, and for the peoples of the whole world. So let's first start about ensuring peace. When Prime Minister Modi said that today's era is not an era of war, it caught the ears of the entire world. What a powerful idea. What a necessary idea. And President Biden has spoken about this moment being an inflection point, one in which freedom, must be fought for, one in which it is worth fighting for. Of course, a lasting peace isn't just something that happens. It has to be carefully built and nurtured, fought for, as our Vice President said so powerfully at the state luncheon. And luckily, the United States and India have the power to set an example to build this more peaceful world in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. A key component of peace is protection. As we've unfortunately seen over the past three years, we live in a world where countries ignore sovereign borders. They advance their claims through violence and destruction. This is not the world we want. This is not the world that we need. But together, the United States and India can build a bulwark against this might makes right mentality. Working together, the world's two largest democracies can bolster the security, the stability, the prosperity of the entire world. And our countries already do so much to ensure the peace, whether it's our troops conducting joint training operations from the mountains of Alaska to the Red Sea, our forces who are friends thanks to the strong tradition of exchanges at the strategic, operational, 
and tactical level, and our country's defense industries that are increasingly connected. In fact, components made right here in India already keep US Apache helicopters and C-130 transport aircraft in the sky. And soon, we'll see advanced jet engines made together right here in India. So what happens next? Well, during the discussions that I witnessed last week in DC, our leaders pledged to accelerate our momentum through building together and working together. So let's start with building together, because this is very important. When the US and India work together to co-produce military equipment, we create a state-of-the-art system at a sustainable cost and with resilient supply chains for India, for the United States, and for our partners around the world. And the announcement made during Prime Minister Modi's official state visit set a marker and highlighted this incredible potential through the co-production work that is already happening in airframes and engineering, and the planned work we hope to see in aero engines, artillery, and ground vehicles, to name just a few, we are poised to further deepen co-production to tackle new opportunities, some that we can't even imagine today as warfare itself changes in the years ahead. In the Oval Office, the President told the Prime Minister that he thought in the next five years, war would change more than we've seen it change in the last 75 years. So that takes me to point two. Let's start talking about working together for peace. You see, our partnership is anchored, not just by the ability of our militaries, but by the values of our nations, the common values that we cherish, freedom, respect for sovereignty, and for all humankind. In turn, our partnership can anchor the region and deliver benefits on a massive scale. And I hope soon that we'll see the United States and India working together across the Pacific and into the Atlantic, from Central Asia to Southern Africa. We can stand together against these common threats and those who would upend the common good for their benefit. We can stand together for choice against coercion. We can stand together as a force for stability to avert regional and global crisis. And we can deploy our ships together in the Pacific and Indian Oceans and even beyond to ensure maritime security for all. And we can employ our air forces across the Indo-Pacific region to ensure freedom of the skies and the seas and to jointly respond to humanitarian crises from the Sahara to the Pacific Islands. We can coordinate our land force exercises across regions to bolster the sovereign defense of all countries who want to work with us. And these are the opportunities fully within our control now as major defense partners. We have so much momentum to build from. In fact, even between the time of the visit and the speech today, we saw a bipartisan effort to introduce legislation in both chambers with both parties of the US Congress to fast track our engagement and to expand our security cooperation. But like any skill, this takes practice and it takes trust. We need to institutionalize trust amongst us, increasing our human interaction, our communication, and most importantly, our interoperability between our forces. And as we master that on the land, sea, and air, we can advance our partnership into new spaces, including outer space and cyberspace. This bold vision that our leaders and our nations and our forces have put together is already being realized. Not just peace, the absence of war, but the active promotion of freedom. In the words of our president, freedom, no sweeter word, no nobler goal, no higher aspiration. May we remind ourselves that we come together for more than preserving peace, but to work towards freedom for all. So if peace is the predicate, let me turn second then to prosperity, the purpose of our work. What lifts up our people is not just efforts to keep them free from war, but also to be free from want. To work better together to build prosperity for all, including the most vulnerable in our country and across the world. Our countries have a history of working miracles together to empower folks here in India and throughout the world. I believe now it is time to engage on critical emerging technologies to set the stage for the miracles of tomorrow. Last year in Tokyo, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi 
framed an ambitious vision called the Initiative for Critical and Emerging Technology, the artist we know called ISET. And they envisioned a US-India technology partnership that would connect us, that would protect us, and that could detect unseen threats that could do us harm, from the tiniest bacterium to massive cyberspace intrusions. They imagined a US and India working together to build an open, accessible, secure technology ecosystem for collaboration and innovation on tomorrow's leading technologies like space, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and advanced wireless communications. Last week, our leaders took this nascent vision and turbocharged it. As they announced, we're working towards human spaceflight cooperation as partners under the Artemis Accords. And in the coming months, we'll see NASA and Israel astronauts and scientists working together, training together, exploring together side by side, and, and sorry, honing our understanding of space and the planet that we call home. We're deepening our private sector collaboration on space and harmonizing our regulatory and licensing standards. Our long partnership in public health continues to break new ground. We're using artificial intelligence to detect and treat cancer. I told Prime Minister Modi about the app that we have, funded partially through USAID, to cough into a phone here in India and detect tuberculosis with 80% and increasing efficacy so that we can achieve by 2025 the goal of India to eradicate tuberculosis. Thanks to the great work of Dr. Pooja Mukul. Where is Dr. Mukul? I know she's here with us here today. Right here, there you are, behind, behind my, why, why don't you stand up for a second so we can recognize you. Please give her a round of applause. You are the embodiment of what this work is about. Our country's private sector engineers are partnering to provide mobility to individuals across the world who are most in need through prosthetic knee replacements that cost less than $100. This is good for India, this is good for America, this is good for the world. And there's the prosthetic. You can, you can hold it up there, say it right there. Produced right here through that collaboration. And Dr. Mukul, your work stands as a clear example of the invaluable contributions that women working in STEM professions make to the prosperity of both our peoples. And as we expand our workforce participation and education and empower women across all sectors, we're going to unleash the power of our economies. There's so much more to come. And with technology, true power comes from interoperability. But luckily, our shared experience, the United States and India now have a tremendous base of interoperability to work from. You see, as democracies, we believe that the design and use of technology should be informed by our democratic values and respect for human rights. Unfortunately, we live in a world where not every country shares that vision. There are those who would rather use technology as an authoritarian weapon, use it to intimidate their neighbors, control their own citizens, which is why we are working with India to diversify and to deepen our supply chains with trusted partners that reduce dependencies that put our people at risk. In fact, in March, my dear friend, Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, and Commerce and Industry Minister, Piyush Goyal, launched a partnership to make our semiconductor supply chains more resilient. And we saw the fruits of that labor just last week when Micron, Applied Materials, and LAM Research announced agreements to collaborate with India on semiconductors. And just a few weeks ago, our leaders convened the inaugural meeting of the US, U, sorry, India-US Strategic Trade Dialogue, which focused on ways that we could facilitate access to trade and critical technologies while maintaining the necessary controls to prevent their misuse. The strategic trade dialogue is a crucial part of this technology vision, laying a secure foundation for us to collaborate and innovate on space, semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and so much more. On the US side, there's a revolutionary transition underway to ease India's access to these critical technologies. We've given that a lot of lip service in the past, but now it's becoming real. And as founding members of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF, we can also work as partners to come up with standards, increase and, prosperity and interoperability across our entire region. You see, IPEF connects the United States and India with 12 other key partners across East and Southeast Asia 
to promote these economic opportunities. And working together with our IPEF partners, the United States and India can increase the prosperity of our own people and create opportunities for the entire world. And of course, together with Australia and Japan, our countries act together as a quad, addressing these same challenges across the Indo-Pacific region, from healthcare to maritime awareness to cybersecurity. And last week, we put down our trade swords and forged them into plowshares, reducing tariffs on US agricultural products like almonds and apples while providing fewer barriers to Indian steel products. It's time for us not only to put those barriers down, but as we begin to put old trade fights into the rearview mirror, let me boldly suggest it's time for us to raise our ambitions higher in the coming months. Let us tear down the bureaucratic, administrative, and legislative hurdles that have held us back and reimagine future agreements that make the US-India economic relationship potentially one of the most frictionless in the world. But as we raise the standard of living here in the US and so dramatically as we witness here in India, we face a threat to that second P, prosperity, from a third P. It's not just a threat to our countries, but a threat across the globe. And this threat demands an equally bold agenda so that together we can do better for our planet. It's difficult to overstate what this threat is. Talk to any young person today and she'll articulate what this means. We witness this, certainly I did as a local leader, from floods to fires, typhoons to monsoons, extreme weather, we were just talking about this in the director's office, cause incalculable damage to critical infrastructure that billions of people need to access for power, water, food, healthcare, and human connection. People are dying from heat waves, from California to Calcutta, and climate change undermines our security and causes serious economic disruptions, costing the global economy an estimated more than 2.2 trillion dollars over just the last two years alone. As we see without urgent action, climate change could push another 100 million people into poverty by 2030. That's not the future that we want. That is not the future that we want. We need something better than that. As a global community, we need to cut our emissions of harmful gases for the long-term health of our planet, this is an essential step. Cities, states, regions can lead as well as nations. When I was mayor of Los Angeles, one of the founding cities of the Urban 20 or U20 movement, I joined with mayors from other G20 cities with a group called C40 that I chaired of the 100 largest cities of the world. And we launched a movement to cut emissions at the local, subnational level on stage in Glasgow, speaking just after Prime Minister Modi made his promises about this country. And now as ambassador, I'm so excited that India is hosting the sixth U20 cycle this year as part of its G20 presidency. That G20 theme of one earth, one family, one future recognizes how local action partnered with global leadership can drive positive lasting change. You see, it's our city, town, and village residents after all who experience our economies at the ground level as they start new businesses, search for new jobs, spend time stuck in traffic, and strive for clean air, clean water, and housing for their families. Our cities need the health and the infrastructure investments that they deserve. Those of you in Delhi and India's other major cities well appreciate this urgency. So how do we put this intention into action? We must strive for integration. We must link economic growth with environmental sustainability, urban density with green space, and diversity with social harmony. Now is the time to harness our technology to make our environmental agenda a reality and work together to save our planet. I'm so pleased to see our countries collaborating so closely in this space through our effort, efforts in the India-led Solar Alliance, for example through US government support for groundbreaking companies like First Solar in the state of Tamil Nadu. And last week, our leaders emphasized our shared vision to rapidly deploy clean energy at a scale and highlighted our plans 
to accelerate cooperation in green hydrogen, offshore and onshore wind, and other emergency te emerging technologies. They underscored exploration to increase our minerals security cooperation, which I'm very excited about, and ensure that we have the means and resources to advance our clean energy goals in things like battery technology and zero emission vehicles. And our private industries, most importantly, we talked about this upstairs, are finally working together. As we speak, Boeing is working with the Indian Institute of Petroleum to develop sustainable aviation fuels from Indian lives a feedstock. As the climate crisis intensifies, we'll also need to engage the entire global community collectively. India has led the way on this, and I want to thank India for its leadership by forming the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. That's a fancy way of saying an organization that will actually meet people where they are in confronting the climate crisis, those who are on the frontline communities. And we're very pleased this year to be co-chairing that effort together with India. Together, we're strengthening early warning systems for climate hazards, including access to real-time data that can save lives, helping to take early action and strengthening the capacity of institutions, communities, governments, to proactively address risk to reduce exposure and vulnerability to natural hazards. Next, we have to, as I said, come together to not just speak at the national level, but to help leaders at the subnational level in Indian states and local communities who can lead and learn together with the United States regions and cities how to best implement greener building codes, transportation networks, and electricity grids. You see, together we can and must adapt our resilience to safeguard our people, our livelihoods, and infrastructure. So that's the third P, a safer, more prosperous, healthy planet. They're all the foundation of our work so that the last P, our people, can realize their potential, realize their dignity. In the end, all I talked about is really about one thing and one thing alone. This U.S.-India partnership is about personal relationships and building those bridges between people. I came here first as a teenager when I was just 14 years old, and I saw firsthand how connected we are to each other, despite differences in language, in wealth, in social status, in geography, and it changed my life forever. I wouldn't be here today giving this speech if it wasn't for that trip. I've come back to this country every decade since. I've studied Hindi. I've learned the history and the culture of this region. I may not be Indian, but India is a big part of me. It shaped who I am today. And I wonder how many people in this room have a similar connection either as Americans to India or as Indians to the United States, through education, through family, through food, or American culture. I would venture to say all of us in this room have that people-to-people -people connection. Now multiply those in the United States by four million, one for each member of the Indian American diaspora currently living in the United States, and that's the power of our people-to-people -people connection. It drives everything that we do. So my goal as ambassador is to make these personal ties from the United States to India even stronger, to give as many people as possible in both countries the opportunity to have the same life-changing experience that I did. I see students in this room today, and I'm always inspired by your dedication. I want you to have every opportunity to realize your dreams. The Indian diaspora in the United States is so strong, so vibrant, that Indians generally know the United States better than Americans know India, and that has to change. I think, Indian, I think Americans, excuse me, are missing out. So I want to bring more Americans to India to study, to research, to work, to visit. When our country's leaders announce the expansion of scholarships, to encourage American students to come study here in India, including under our joint Fulbright Nehru Educational Exchange Foundation, it laid a clear marker that we're coming and we can't wait. And the US Department of State is also working with Indian academic institutions to develop compelling study abroad programs with US colleges and universities. The director and I were talking about research opportunities that we should be envisioning and capitalizing on. And we forged a new joint task force to do just that 
linking the, Ameri sorry, the Association of American Universities and leading Indian institutions to expand these research and university partnerships. We're working with the government of India to help make it easier for US universities to have a presence here in India, to create joint degree programs, to foster joint research programs in STEM fields, as well as upskilling opportunities through community colleges, something that the Prime Minister witnessed in his time with the First Lady. We are thrilled that so many Indians want to experience the United States directly, whether it's studying, whether it's investing, or whether it's just seeing family or friends, or even visiting the many wonders of the United States. And we'd like to see the number of Indians coming to the US grow. It takes a lot of work, coordination, to respond to the extraordinary interest that Indians have in America, which brings us to, you guessed it, visas, a very popular topic. We are doing heroic work, and I want to thank our consular section and our consular officers. These are folks who are young foreign service officers who spend three years every single day doing about 120 interviews of Indians to help bring more Indians here. But we are doing more than ever before to eliminate barriers that prevent qualified travelers from experiencing the United States. And one way we get there is by expanding our operations. We're already doing that. We're currently processing more visas faster than the US mission in India has ever done before. And we set a goal for ourselves to process at least 1 million visas in 2023. That's a really big number in the United States. It might not be a big number here in India, but it's huge when it comes to travel. And we're already more than halfway towards the, reaching that goal. Our investments are bringing real results. We're seeing wait times for first time tourist visa interviews fall by more than 50% just in recent months. And in coming months, we're going to continue investing and in expanding those visa operations and broadening our team. In fact, one of the agreements that probably got lost in the news last week was 12 additional bodies that will help us do that, thanks to the government of India approving those new positions here to be at our new consulate in Hyderabad. We're going to reduce the need for in-person interviews, which allows consular teams around the world to assist in processing visas for the growing number of Indian travelers. And we are committed to ensuring that a whole new generation of Indian adventurers, explorers, entrepreneurs, and scholars can access and experience America. And it was announced just last week that in coming years, we're going to see not just one, but two new consulates here in India, in Bangalore and Ahmedabad to add to the four plus Delhi five posts that we already have here today. Of course, investing in people also means standing up for the rights of everyone, especially the most marginalized and the most vulnerable. And the United States will continue to engage with Indians across the country from all walks of life. India is a country of tremendous diversity with different faiths, with different heritages, different languages and experiences. And we celebrate this deeply syncretic culture that makes India so powerfully unique. And we'll continue to engage on human rights issues as we have always done, as we do with countries around the world, an area that I approach with great humility because the United States continues to learn through hard experience how important it is to be honest about our challenges in our own country and confront them head on. But as Mahatma Gandhi phrased it so well, our ability to reach unity in diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. And as Vice President Harris said last week, reflecting on the lessons that her grandfather, who helped fight for India's independence, taught her, that we must not only have democracy, we have to work to defend democracy. In America, we're still not perfect, but the American experiment continues alongside the American dream, just as the Indian experiment continues alongside the Indian dream. And that Indian dream, I think, is just as potent and challenging. But in the face of our domestic and international challenges, the idea of India and the United States dreaming and succeeding together are an unbeatable combination. So as we work together to invest in peace, invest in prosperity, invest in our planet, and to the benefit of our people, we're going to unlock the full potential of what the US India relationship is all about. My friends, together, our countries can bring transformation to some of our greatest challenges. Together, we can be a partnership for true good in the world. That's my dream. And today, 
in the weeks and the months ahead, I want it to be your dream too. And I want to hear how you see that dream, that U.S.-India partnership, how we can realize those dreams together. Sapni Sakar Karna. Thank you very much.